Hello, my name is Jerry Ford and I am a garlic grower in the upper Midwest. Um, my farm is about an hour west of Minneapolis and one of our crops is certified organic garlic. I started growing back in uh, 2002 and I still love doing it. But I give you a perspective from a grower on diseases and pests of garlic in the upper Midwest. I'm also the director of the Minnesota Garlic Festival, uh, which is coming up to our 16th year in 2021. The festival is a production of the Sustainable Farming Association, as is the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project, along with the partners you see there on the screen. If you appreciate this kind of programming and these resources, I invite you to consider membership in Sustainable Farming Association. The funding for the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project ends in early 2022, and memberships will be what carries this forward. There's a wealth of information on the Garlic Project website, more than just the scary diseases. Uh, this is not meant to be a complete list of all those things that go bump in the night for garlic, but rather the ones you're more likely to encounter in the Midwest and a couple that are on their way. And again, my lens is the upper Midwest. This may not apply to other parts of the country. And I'm not a plant pathologist, so I won't get into the science beyond a layperson's understanding. I've seen some of these problems up close, though, and I'm concerned about the other ones. Uh, what I hope to give you is what to look out for and possible preventions or management practices. And let me say that most growers go through most of their seasons without any significant disease problems. And I don't want to scare off any new growers with all these little beasties. Of course, the worst pest or disease is the one that you're dealing with in any particular season. That said, I'm going to start off with the worst of the worst. First. Can you tell that I don't like this one at all? Uh, and I feel very strongly about it. It can look the same as uh, other diseases like Fusarium, which we'll talk about in a moment, but it's way more wicked once it gets progressed. If you get it, it will thrive in the soil. Without taking extreme measures, no alliums are likely to grow there well again. It can be eradicated from the soil with some draconian measures that will, well, if you're certified organic, you'll lose that certification going through that process. And it persists in vegetative matter, old mulch, plant leaves, and of course, infected garlic. And it swims. Water can carry it to other parts of the field and it can move between plants through moisture. Thank God it doesn't fly. The prevention is testing. Do it every June. You can do it at any point in the plant cycle, but June is the optimum time uh, when the plants are at their, uh, their biggest uh, growing development. And of course, you want to send your worst plants when you do this form submission. And this is again on the website for the, for the um, uh, Minnesota Premium Garlic Project. You can get the procedure forms there uh, and the whole how to do it. Um, now one of the other things is only to buy seed stock that has been tested. Uh, or you can, if you can feel you can be assured that that grower hasn't added any form of untested sources in the last few years. If you do get this disease, I can send you to um, a grower and an expert on this who can walk you through the, the ways to get it out of your soil. He did beat it, um, but it was not easy. So get your garlic tested. This is your prevention. Uh, there's not really a, uh, a way to um, take care of it once you have it. We're going to talk about pre prevention. Have a closed system. Plant only from your own seed stock once you get that established. If you do buy from a grower who doesn't test, ask the right questions. How, where did you get your garlic? How long ago was it? How long has it been growing in your, um, in your fields? And 
buy your seed stock early. You know, don't wait till the last minute right before you're going to plant. Buy it early, which is a good thing to do anyway, and get it early. And if you have any suspicions about it, test it. You can send the seed stock in, um, a couple of your bulbs, into the plant disease clinic and get it tested. Uh, when you get your seed stock that you're buying, if you see any signs of disease uh, in there, just send it back. Ask for a refund if it doesn't look up to your ex expectations. So there, the University of Minnesota Extension has put together a, a really good paper on this. Uh, it's actually easier to find on the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project page than it is on their website. Now, many of you are familiar with aster yellow phytoplasm, yellow's phytoplasma, uh, from other crops. It does affect other vegetables. Uh, but in 2012, it had never been documented in garlic in the upper Midwest before that. In May of 2012, we had great looking garlic plants after a very early spring and early emergence. By mid-June, it looked like Dr. Rosen's picture there of all those yellowing plants. The other pictures are what it looks like if the plant survives to harvest. Most Minnesota growers were seeing it in 2012 uh, to some degree or another, but nobody knew what it was. We sent samples to the plant disease clinic, and when the plant pathologist there, Dmitry Malov, had eliminated all the other possibilities, AYP was what was left, unlikely as it seemed. He published a paper on it. It was uncommonly warm that April. The snow was gone, and the jet stream brought the AYP leaf hoppers up from the south in historic numbers, plague-like numbers. There was very little else that was green at that time for them to eat, so they tried the garlic. They didn't like it much, but it was enough for them to transmit the microscopic phytoplasma that they carry, and then they moved on. We didn't even know to look for them at that time. Uh, that little critter, the phytoplasma, sets up in the vascular system of the plant and gradually multiplies un until it was like having blocked arteries. I lost 75% of my crop. Others were wiped out and some were barely affected. It was like there were these south to north bands as the leaf hoppers rode the jet stream. Now let me point out that the pictures of the bulbs again uh, are after harvest that they made it that far. A lot did not even get far enough that you would even bother to pull them out of the ground. Now, in 2017, we had another infestation, but they came in late May and not in the plague-like numbers. And there was tastier stuff for them growing that, that took the pressure off of the garlic by late May. Uh, we'd see the occasional bulb with infection. Um, the top, those pictures there are from that year. So prevention Pray that the perfect storm doesn't happen again. Move further north where they don't get there before they have other things to eat. You're going to be roguing out diseased plants and don't replant those infected cloves. Uh, we didn't know that at first. We didn't know if it would carry over, but it does. Uh, it does persist in the vegetative matter, but it does not persist in the soil and it doesn't transfer from plant to plant. Uh, row covers are probably not practical, but it would probably help if you knew they were coming. That's a lot of row covers in a garlic field. Um, now, after that aster apocalypse in uh, 2012, some growers bought all new seed stock. And a couple of those growers got garlic bloat nematode from that seed stock. It was like jumping from the frying pan to the fire. I kept selecting and roguing it out because I really wanted to save the genetics I already had in my seed stock. And I bought some from a grower further north who had only a very light AYP occurrence and who let me pick through the bulbs one at a time. 
Uh, it was a long process. Again, the, as you see here, the University of Minnesota Extension has a good one sheet on AYP. And again, it's actually easier to find the thing on the Garlic Project website. There are a few pathogens that cause root rot and general rot in garlic. Um, penicillium is another one besides fusarium. And the symptoms look much the same in all of these, what I call rotters. Uh, and the prevention is much the same. Now fusarium, the most common uh, in our region, is a fungus that persists in the soil and it's common. It's in all Midwest soil. It's, it's just there. Uh, if it reaches certain concentrations or if a bulb is compromised in some other way, it will overwhelm the garlic's built-in defenses. Then it will generally rot the root base first and work up from there. When you see plants yellowing in the field, like um, the ones in the picture there, this is probably the most likely culprit. Um, now, brown tips, I wanna tell you this, brown tips on the leaves, right at the tips of the leaves, when they turn brown, are not necessarily an indication of an infection. I get calls and emails every year, you know, on the tips of my leaves are brown. Um, I have it every year. My guess, and this is just a guess, is that it's a nutrient deficiency. Maybe the bulb is taking so much energy uh, that at the expense of the leaf tips. This is just a guess. Uh, now, it's when you get yellowing in the leaves, and when that gets going, uh, that you have a problem, not when there's just brown tips. So how to prevent this stuff? When we talk about rotation, a four-year rotation, that means don't come back to the same spot for four years. And avoid planting any other alliums as well, onions, leeks, etc., cetera, in that, those fields. Yes, there are growers who get away with less than a four-year rotation, but they are, are either very experienced growers uh, or just lucky. Uh, now, I used to say that garlic doesn't like to keep its feet wet, but I've modified that it doesn't like to stand in the same water for long periods. If the water is moving through, such as raised beds or on slopes, there appears to be much less of a problem with building up these pathogens. Now, once a plant turns yellow, it's not going to be worth saving. Go ahead and get it out of there. Rogue it out, as we say. Uh, when you walk through the fields, you see a yellowed plant, just get it out. Uh, if you suspect root rot is in your planting stock, uh, get rid of the bad ones. Don't plant those. Uh, you can go through and inspect them as you go um, or get different planting stock. Now, this is why when I'm inspecting new seed stock, the first thing I do is I smell it. Once it's been properly cured, there should be little or no smell in an uncompromised bulb. If a well-cured bulb smells funky, something to be suspicious of. So after I've smelled it, then I look at and feel around the root base. I, if some or all of that base is compromised, or if it's soft, I pass on those bulbs. Uh, Oregon State University has a nice fact, fact sheet on fusarium, and on our website we also have a link to uh, a Cornell study that um, looked at the effects of fusarium on yield. Oh, so some of these other rotters. Uh, I'm going to mention these, though as I said, the management is much the same as it is for fusarium. Mosaic is more a description of the symptom than the cause. I suspect some of you are looking at this picture right now and saying, yeah, I see some of that every year. So do I. Uh, there are a host of viruses that can cause this. Usually the plant wins this battle. I don't rogue out plants that look like this unless it gets to the point where it's almost all yellow.
I've heard other growers in the region say that they've dealt with this fungus, with botrytis, though I've never actually seen it myself. It thrives in, the, in cool, wet conditions, and it often comes on during curing or storage. You don't see it until then. Um, botrytis can be transmitted in seed stock, and it can carry over through the winter. It can also be exacerbated by late nitrogen application or even over application of nitrogen. And then also uh, poor curing and storage practices. It's very opportunistic. If the bulb is damaged by say insects or mechanically, botrytis can be a secondary infection. And actually penicillium can look a lot like this too. Uh, and it would probably take a lab test to know the difference between them. So here we go again, uh, rotation. Now this late fertilization thing is a good point for another reason. After early May or so, the benefits of adding nitrogen are minimal. It's got to be already in the ground um, at that point. Uh, and once the, the, the plant gets, uh, well, especially near uh, scaping, it's not going to do any good. Over application of nitrogen has other ramifications as well. Soil testing, we, it's, it's good to get into uh, the habit of doing soil testing just to make sure you're not over applying nitrogen and balancing everything else out as well. Now we'll talk uh, about some of the insect problems in a bit. Uh, it would be nice to be able to harvest when it's not wet out, but that's rare in the upper Midwest in, in July. Uh, so those curing and storage practices become more important. It's hard for me to overemphasize airflow in your curing and storage, getting lots of airflow to every bulb. Um, now rough handling during harvest can cause all kinds of problems. Uh, bruised or compromised bulbs just aren't going to store as well. And as with all of these nasties, being very careful with purchased seed stock or having a closed system is uh, also a good preventative. Another fungus that's uh, much more common in onions and leeks, the picture is actually of a leek leaf, looks like mosaic on hallucinogens with that purple in there. And it's a different pathogen than mosaic. The reason I include it is, is that in those really wet years of 2018 and 2019, uh, I heard reports from a couple of growers in the region who had it in their garlic, though I don't recall, recall if it was self-identified or lab tested. As you can see, there are a bunch of these different fungi. Uh, again, the control and prevention are the same. Avoid infected seed, air circulation is important, even out in the field with air circulation. Space between the plants, weed control. You get a lot of weeds in there, the air doesn't circulate as well. And again, rotation, and don't plant when it's going, where it's going to stand in water. Now with some of these fungal pathogens, there's an argument to be made for curing with the leaves and stalks attached. The idea is that when the stalks are cut, this presents a wound for the fungus to take hold. Remember, many of these blighters are opportunistic. They're looking for a way into the bulb. Okay, white rot. It's not a real problem. It, well, it's not a problem here as much, but in other parts of the country, uh, it really is. And according to Cornell University, the most significant disease affecting allium production worldwide is white rot. Uh, fortunately, we haven't seen much of it uh, here, but we must be vigilant. It's another fungus that manifests a lot like botrytis, but it's far worse. Uh, it can be in the soil, it can live on in the soil, uh, in plant material, and in water, uh, but thank God the spores are not airborne. It will look like so many other bad guys at first with yellowing on the foliage, usually before the scapes come on. It won't be until you start roguing them out that you see the stuff that's in the picture on the left. 
so what's the prevention on white rot management? Um, just don't get it. Again, be very careful with purchased seed stock, especially from areas with high incidence of white rot. I'm gonna name names, uh, New York State, Maine, uh, in those areas, they've had uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, this one is a lot like garlic bloat nematode that, like I say, once it's in the field, there's not much to be done about it except don't plant garlic in that field anymore. And like garlic bloat nematode, it can travel in the plant material, the soil and the water. Uh, so just don't get it. Again, a closed system, very effective. Once you find varieties that you like, as you're planting your garlic and you're expanding your repertoire there, uh, just grow from those. Don't buy more seed stock unless you have to, uh, and then thoroughly vet new seed stock. Uh, now, let's keep this out of the upper Midwest, shall we? I, I'd hate to add this to the garlic bloat nematode testing that we already do. Um, I don't know, we probably should before too long. Um, so, are you depressed yet? Uh, okay, let's move on to some more common things that aren't so cataclysmic and often can be more easily controlled. Now, garlic mites, it's that little bug there uh, that gets in and has some resistance to garlic's built-in defenses. Now, no, I'm not going to give you a recipe for a new cocktail with, uh, with the vodka there. Uh, though we do have garlic Bloody Marys at the garlic festival, they're really good. Um, now I'll get to the I'll get to the vodka in a minute. Some of us are starting to think it's much more common in the Upper Midwest that we used them. We used to believe that the garlic mites are more common. Uh, that and and it it can be the primary infestation that opens the door for others. Uh, in addition to the damage you see in the picture, sometimes you'll see a little pinhole right in the bulb wrappers. And once it's made that pinhole and gotten through, well, then some of those funguses or viruses can start uh, getting in there. Uh, the thing is, when you find it, it's almost always in stored garlic. The plant won't show that it's got the mites out in the field very often. Uh, they may be more active out in the field but it just doesn't tend to show up until you start looking at the bulbs more closely while you're curing. Uh, so our management, again, well, guess what? Rotation. Uh, the University of California's Inter Integrated Pest Management Department says uh, also to not plant it immediately after brassicas, corn, grain, sedan grass, or grass cover crops. You're kind of limited on what you can put in that rotation. Um, and I think that's if you're already seeing a real problem with the mites, that following the brassicas and the grasses uh, just increases them. Now, flooding fields, you drown the little buggers. It's not very practical for most of us uh, here uh, on our slopes or in our uh, fields. Uh, this is more for the large commercial growers. Dipping cloves in alcohol has been documented as beneficial. Now, if you're certified organic, you can't use isopropyl. So the vodka is um, a good way to go, even Everclear. Um, I, and about an hour of dipping the cloves in it should, should kill off any remaining mites. And this is just me, but if, you, if I don't see mite damage, I'm not bothering with the dip. It's kind of thing that you need to know they're there. Otherwise, you know, that's a lot of extra work. Um, there's also a soak that you can do in 2% soap. And this is soap, not like laundry detergents. And 2% mineral oil. And this is a 24-hour soak before planting. And it's been, it's been successful in, in reducing mites as well. Again, check with your organic certifier if you're organic to make sure you can use those things. Now this hot water, there's also this hot water treatment that people talk about. Um, that it, but the problem with it is it gets so hot that it can ask, actually decrease germination. 
Um, I mean, you're going to 130, 140 degrees with this, and I'm not even quite sure how you do that consistently with a large amount of seed. Um, but uh, people are doing it. Um, and I think the alcohol is probably more fun. Uh, now, there is some also some uh, indication that with lighter infestations, they just go away during curing. Uh, it's like they lose interest and leave. Um, now, there's more details on all of these things, again, on the Garlic Project webpage. Uh, you, UMass and Oregon State have got some uh, good info on this. Uh, again, all these are on our website. Now, Emblissia, some people call this blotch mold. Uh, skin blotch usually hits you during storage. Um, sorry about that with the slides. Here we go. Um, these are some of my actual table garlic stuff that I saved for myself. I ignored my own advice and I threw them in the root cellar with the potatoes. Uh, it's too moist and there's no natural light. And, and you may have heard me say before that ideal, in my opinion, conditions for curing and storage involve some natural light uh, and lots of airflow. Uh, and that just doesn't, usually happen in a root cellar. So this happened. Um, now, often these bulbs are uh, going to just be superficial. That damage is only gonna be superficial. As you can see, you peel off one layer of skin there and you got rid of, um, got rid of that blotch mold. Uh, it's just, it's cosmetic. Uh, it can, if left to itself, it can permeate right on through. Uh, so proper storage. Rotation to a certain degree again, but it does hang out in organic matter in the soil. Okay, now we'll talk about the leaf miner. Uh, this uh, is a pathogen that I have not seen, uh, and I don't think anybody in the upper Midwest has seen this yet. Uh, and I, I hope we don't. Uh, it's, um, it's gotten as far west as Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania last time I checked. Came over from Europe and Turkey. Sorry about the slides advancing again. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, I, from um, Eastern Europe, Turkey, and, and it's a real problem. This bug is a real problem over there. And it's becoming a problem in Pennsylvania. Uh, again, I'd be careful buying seed stock from Eastern states uh, that may have the, the, this in, infestation. Um, now, this is the fly's larva. They, eat into the soft tissue of the plant, and then, as it happens so often, it's an opportunistic fungus or bacteria that then comes in and does in the plant. Uh, there are some total crop losses in onions and leeks out east uh, with lesser damage to the garlic, um, but it still is doing some, some serious damage out there. And according to Cornell University, there are two organic approved insecticides. This as a direct, and then Entrust, which is a spinozad. Um, and as always, you need to ask your certifier before doing that if you're certified organic. Um, now I heard from a few growers in 2020 that they were losing scapes to this. One tested the plant, uh, one of the growers at the plant disease clinic and confirmed that it was anthracnose. Now there's no evidence yet that it affects the bulbs, uh, but it's a bummer if you're trying to sell scapes. Uh, I, I, I kind of thought about it that for those of us who just remove the scapes and don't sell them, uh, maybe it's saving us a little work because eventually the scape just sort of falls off and again, there doesn't seem to be any damage on down into uh, the bulb. Um, now, there's not a whole lot you can do to prevent this. Rotation will probably help uh, reduce the spores present in the field, um, but it's um, you're probably already convinced about rotation for all the other reasons at this point. Uh, it, it's rain splashing up. Uh, is generally raindrops splashing back up and carrying the fungus up to the tender um, escape there. 
I don't always, uh, well, what happened to waxy breakdown? Hmm. Uh, well, we've got wire worms. <laughs> My apologies about that. Um, the wire worms are, uh, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, they're all over the country. Uh, and they are the uh, larva of the snap beetle. Uh, and you just, if you dig up soil, you, you'll, you're, you're eventually going to see some of these things. Um, they can be about an inch long, uh, and they will sometimes do what you see in one of my garlic bulbs there, just burrow into the thing. I've never seen them in the bulbs themselves. Uh, there, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of prevention on these. Insecticides aren't going to work. Uh, it's once it's in there and gone, the damage is done. Uh, and you just, you're not able to sell that bulb. Um, it's probably still good for seed stock because it's not really leaving uh, in, in, in anything behind. Um, so it, it's, when you see this pinhole like this, that's probably what it is. Um, and, and we've seen quite a bit of it recently in Minnesota. I've always thought Waxy Breakdown sounded like a good name for a bluegrass band. Um, I have heard reports uh, of this in a farm in Minnesota in 2020 uh, and a farm in Michigan uh, same year. The bottom line is it just, it just happens sometimes. There's, there's nothing really that you did wrong. Um, it's not a disease. It's not an insect. It just happens. Nobody seems to know why. Though one theory is that high temperatures during the growing season or while curing could cause it. Um, it's a little frustrating because you can, um, you can always tell, you can't always tell when it's in a bulb and it ends up being your customer who tells you that, hey, my, my uh, clothes looked waxy or they even kind of turned to liquid or sometimes they even get the liquid evaporates out and they become totally rock hard inside there. Um, so uh, it's not really anything you can do much about. There's no real prevention for it. And then sometimes stuff just happens. Weird things tend to happen to garlic because it's kind of weird in the first place. Uh, this is not a scene from some science fiction alien film here. Uh, it's a complete garlic plant within the bulb wrappers that grew entirely underground. In the spring of 2018, we got ourselves a, a very late heavy snowstorm. The plants were starting to emerge, and then in my field, three feet of heavy wet snow mashed the mulch down like concrete. And now these plants are trying to grow underneath all that snow. This plant couldn't break through the mulch and just said, well, to heck with it. And it decided to just grow anyway. So you have all the components of the plant right there within the uh, bulb. I actually planted these cloves uh, and they did just fine. They weren't quite as big as I would have liked to be and to do. So sometimes stuff like this just happens. What are you going to do? So hopefully this hasn't scared you off from growing garlic. Uh, with some vigilance and care, you're probably going to see very little of these things. But feel free to contact me with questions or corrections. Uh, I do love talking about garlic. Uh, happy growing.